let's get started. That's better. I guess everybody's enjoying sunshine, whoever who's not here. <laughs> and it's a long weekend, huh? Except there's one day on Monday that's not a that's not a holiday. But that's good. I, I appreciate that you guys are here. So you'll learn about some exciting things. So you see that there's a list of items over here that we're going to cover. So now we're moving into alternative execution paradigms in computer architecture. So maybe maybe we should really retitle this course as like great ideas in computing systems design or computing platforms design because we, we will cover some really great ideas actually. We've been covering some of them, we'll cover even more. And actually these are all employed in existing processors so they're, they've all impacted life and I'll give you examples uh, of these. Okay, so if you recall, we were talking about out of order execution, we went through this example, so you should be very comfortable with that example. You should be very comfortable with questions related to that example like the reverse engineering question that I gave you at the end of the lecture. You're given the state of the machine at a cycle, let's say cycle seven, and you're asked to derive what's the data flow graph. And since out of order execution is essentially building the data flow graph of a computer, computer not, of a program on the fly, you should be able to do that, at least partially. If I can find this, I'll be able to tell you more, but I don't have it here. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, but I'll have it in the slides. Okay, okay, we'll cover more. So remember optional homeworks, we're gonna put more optional homeworks related to out-of-order execution later on. And I actually added these chapters over here, even though these chapters are relatively short. They, so this book, for example, dedicates just these parts to execution paradigms that we're gonna cover for the rest of the lecture, uh, for the rest of, the rest of this class. So. It's a little bit imbalanced, as you can see, right? But if you don't know some of these execution paradigms, it's going to be hard for you to appreciate how existing computers are designed today. Okay, and remember, we'll talk more about when may uh, today in the context of compilers. Okay, and my general suggestion, hopefully you remember, this is really good for education beyond taking classes. Uh, it will open your mind, I think. It's always good to do these things, like attending these colloquia where people who have accomplished a lot come and uh, share their knowledge. Okay, we were talking about this, and remember this was uh, the code example that we ran through yesterday, and we did a lot of exercises like this. We figured out how to execute this code on a machine that has a multiplier uh, and, a, and an adder, and where you could actually do out of order execution on that machine. Okay, I found my thing over here, that's good. Now I have my complete set of slides. And remember, this was the last exercise we did. This is the state of the, state of the register alias table and reservation stations in cycle seven. And at this point, all of these six instructions are renamed. And you basically have all of the instructions in the machine. And some of them are executing, some of them are waiting, doesn't matter. But the question could be, what is the, uh, if you're given just this, what does the code sequence look like? And you should be able to come up with this, just based on this, because this, is, uh, this, this figure essentially shows which instructions are what, whether they're adds or multiplies, what are they waiting for, whether they're ready or not, uh, what are the inputs and outputs, as you can see, right? So you can clearly form a data flow graph because the nodes in the data flow graph are actually in the reservation stations. So this is a node in the data flow graph. This is another node, another node, another node, another node, another node. And the arcs of the data flow graph are actually the tags because we've actually formed those tags to communicate between different instructions. Essentially, the arcs are the tags. And then you can remap the tags backwards to the register IDs because you know what tag corresponds to what register ID, right? So it's beautiful. You can essentially reverse engineer this relatively easily. And I did most of it, but I didn't assign the register, uh, exact register IDs uh, to, uh, to the arcs, but you can do that also. So I'll leave this with you. You can actually, this will be part of your optional homework question. And one can come up with many, many questions. One can actually show you the state of the out of order machine and ask you what the data flow graph looks like or vice versa. So it's fun. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, but this shows that this is really a data flow machine. We built the part of the data flow graph of the program inside the machine, right? And you can actually reverse engineer it easily. Now, because this is a data flow graph, you may not be able to perfectly reverse engineer the sequential code. I'll let you figure that out while you're doing the exercise. Because remember, data flow graph doesn't have ordering across instructions. So this instruction may not be ordered sequentially with this instruction, or these three instructions may not be ordered sequentially, because they all happen to be available at the same time, right? But you can infer that if I give you one more information, and that information is if uh, the reservation stations are allocated in sequential order. So A is allocated first, B is allocated next, C is allocated next, dot, dot, dot. If I tell you that sequential reservation station entries are allocated to instructions that are sequential in a sequential program, then you can easily say that, oh, this ad must be the first ad that allocates, assuming these are the only instructions fetched, right? Okay, so basically by giving constraints, you can actually uh, figure out exactly what the code ordering should be. Make sense? Okay, good. So you'll do this exercise yourself, hopefully. Oh, wow, what is this? This doesn't look good. Okay, let's do this first. You can ignore this one. So when is the reservation station entry deallocated? Actually, I'll fix it because I don't like it. <laughs> you, can, you can take a mini break, if you will. <laughs> now you're seeing the entire slide, so that's okay. Stop. So I make it appear. And now I wish it automatically reordered these things, but apparently it doesn't. So six, there you go. That's the beauty of sequential ordering, right? <laughs> See, you can make sense out of this thing sequentially, but out of order, it doesn't make full sense. That's exactly the problem we have with imprecise and precise exceptions. So when is a reservation station entry deallocated? Basically, when an instruction finishes execution. If it's done with all of its results, if it's written, everybody has received the uh, tag and the value, then it can be deallocated in a machine with imprecise exceptions. We're still talking about a machine that doesn't have precise exceptions. We're, we're going to augment this machine soon with precise exceptions, but the concept, conceptually, it'll be very simple. Okay. Exactly when does an instruction broadcast its tag? If you remember, we broadcast the tag of an instruction one cycle before it really finishes execution, right? For example, if the multiplier takes six cycles, we broadcast the tag in the previous cycle, basically in cycle six, not after it finishes execution. This enables you to forward the data when it becomes available uh, to, the, to the instructions that require the uh, data. Right? Because the assumption is that within that cycle, you do the tag match and you do all of that forward. Well, but if that's not true, then you have a problem, right? Then you may need to actually broadcast your tag earlier. That's a possibility. Actually, existing machines are much more complicated. Whenever they actually schedule an instruction, they actually sometimes broadcast a tag immediately so that when the value becomes ready, the instructions uh, are already selected to be executed. If you heavily pipeline a machine, you may need to wake up an instruction much before the value becomes ready. Of course, you design the machine such that bypassing paths provide that value when the instruction actually needs it. We're not going to go into those complications, but if you actually pipeline the machine very heavily, you will need to be very careful about this. Because if you don't broadcast it at the right time, if you don't send the tag at the right time and wake up an instruction, wake up a dependent instruction early enough, you may have a bubble in the pipeline, right? That instruction wakes up late. As a result, it needs to wait for a while until, yeah, basically it's late. <laughs> Okay, so another question. This actually, these are actually really good questions for uh, interviews, if you will. If you go to an interview at a company, uh, they ask you, and this is a very general question. Should the reservation stations be dedicated to each functional unit, or should it be centralized, global across functional units? So there are trade-offs associated with it. We assume that reservation stations are uh, dedicated, right? Which means that these are the reservation stations for add, these are the reservation stations for multiply, and if you have more than four ads, tough luck. You cannot allocate a reservation station to add, and the machine needs to, be, needs to stall, even though you may have empty reservation stations here that are dedicated for multiply. So this is essentially a very uh, general trade-off. It's, it's the trade-off of static partitioning 
in which case we are statically partitioning the resources we have. If you think about it, we have a total of eight reservation stations, but we're statically dedicating four of them to the adder and four of them to the multiplier. Alternatively, we could have dedicated eight of them to everything and dynamically partitioned it. Right. Now there are trade-offs associated with it. If you statically partition, let's go back here, I guess, if we can switch quickly. Yeah, if you statically partition, just like we did over here, uh, what you can do is you can, this is, this is probably faster because now you can, you, you have only four things to search here, right? And four things to search here, and these searches can happen in parallel. So in terms of cycle time, this could be faster compared to having a single one. I have all these problems with my pens, I don't know why. Compared to having a single eight anti one, uh, that's, there you go, that's better. Oh, you cannot see it. Yeah, single eight anti one over here, zero through seven, that can go to both, right? Now you need to search for tags longer because the wires are longer if, 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 it's, if it's dynamically partitioned and global this way. So that's one trade-off. But if you actually dynamically partition, you may, you may actually adapt to the program uh, much better because if the program has eight ads, you can put all of them into the reservation station, right? Now your reservation station is more general purpose, if you will, and as a result, it can better handle the different instruction mixes that you may have. Here, if you have more than four ads, that's too bad. If you have more than four multiplies, that's also too bad. Here, if you have six ads and two multiplies, you can accommodate all of them over here. So that's the trade-off between static and dynamic partitioning. There are other issues over here. For example, this is add and multiply, but it could be a branch unit over here. And the branch unit, you may be able to optimize, right? Maybe, maybe there's a unit that has only one source, right? You may be able, able to optimize and have different kinds of uh, fields over here. So if you have statically partitioned, you can actually customize the reservation stations to uh, the functional unit. Okay, giving you a lot of ideas here. But you can, you can imagine that there are lots of optimizations that you can do, and there are lots of design choices, and we've covered only uh, the basics of it. Another one over here. Should the reservation stations and reorder buffer store data values? Ignore the reorder buffer for now. We didn't talk about it within the con this context over here. But should the reservation stations store data values or should there be a centralized physical register file where all data values are stored? What are the trade-offs? So we've assumed that you actually store the data values over here. That's actually not how things are built in existing machines because that's very, very expensive, especially if you have, let's say, 100 reservation stations. Basically, if you look over here, there are lots of data values. Now imagine a case where uh, all of the instructions are reading only register one. I'm going to make it extreme. Everybody's going to read register one, register one, register one, register one, register one, dot, dot, dot. Now what will happen? All of the values over here will belong to the same register one or tags, but in this case, let's assume that it's available and the value is a thousand. So you'll basically store a thousand everywhere. <laughs> That's kind of stupid, isn't it? <laughs> so existing machines don't do that. They're a little bit smarter. In the reservation station, they get rid of the values. But instead, they add another register file before the functional units over here. So whenever an instruction wakes up, it doesn't have the values immediately, but it reads another register file. So I'll, I'm gonna call that the physical register file. I called that, that before. And the values are also gone from here. What you do is, you, in the register alias table, you just keep track of whether the register is valid, and if the register is valid, uh, where should it be? So tag is only the physical register file entry now. So you're mapping a, an architectural register to a physical register. For example, R1 is mapped to my favorite register, R55, physical register 55. Let's call it P55. R1 is valid. P55 has a thousand, value 1,000. And all of these instructions that are going to read this are going to read it from P55. So they will store P55 as a tag. Okay, I'm not going to do this. And they will all be valid 
in this case, which means that they are ready to execute. And when they're ready to execute, when an instruction is selected, it goes and reads from the physical register file first, the source registers. In this case, the two ports will have P55 in them. So you'll read two thousands from here. Make sense? So basically, you now we've gotten rid of all of the values in the pipeline and consolidated them into this physical register file. So a renamed register is only here. The purpose of the register alias table is to map the architectural register to the physical register. The purpose of the reservation station is to keep track of the readiness of the physical registers and to select the instruction for execution when both of its sources are ready. And when both of your sources are ready, you take the tags, i.e. the physical register IDs, index the physical register file with the physical register IDs, and then get your registers and directly go to the execution units. Now that's beautiful, right? All of the machines that I know of work this way at this point because they don't store these values. They don't want to store these values. It's a lot of data to store if you think about a 64-bit architecture. And let's say you have 100 entries in your reservation stations. That's 64 times 100 bits, right? Well, times two because you have two sources over here. As opposed to physical register file here, let's say you have 64, it's much smaller, potentially. And it's consolidated over here. Okay. And there's actually an additional complexity that I didn't talk about, because you will need to move the values everywhere uh, if you have the values. So this also eliminates one more thing. Now you don't need to do the value broadcast, right? It's actually even more important. You do the tag broadcast, but you don't need to do the value broadcast. You, got, you get rid of all of those value buses, right? Because you actually store the values only in one place and access them after you're ready to execute, after the instruction is ready to execute. You don't broadcast the values. The instructions, when they're ready to execute, they go to the register file and get the values from there. So this eliminates a lot of the complexity of Thomas Sowell's algorithm we discussed as it was designed in 1965. Today, we're in 2018, so we have these physical register files. And we will see that uh, in the pictures soon. I hope, I, I hope you were able to see this. Okay. Now you can see people have optimized this a lot. I, I'm not even talking about how people have optimized the wake up and select logic because we don't have time, but there is really a lot of work that has gone into that also. Okay, so there are many other design choices for out of order engines. Any questions? Good. So you can imagine many, many other design choices. Oh. Okay, so I will leave uh, this next one as an exercise for you. I will give you how it operates. Basically, the out of order engine that we've discussed doesn't have precise exceptions. If you remember, uh, we retired instructions. I want to find my solutions, if I can. Cycle four, cycle eight, uh, come on, cycle 20. Where is my cycle 20? Cycle eight looks okay also, but 20 would be nicer. Okay, I guess my cycle 20 is gone for some reason. <laughs> but if you remember, uh, our machine, we essentially retired instructions uh, out of order. So instructions were able to write to the register file out of program order. How do we fix that? Well, this was the same problem we had with in-order machine and out-of-order completion. We fixed that in a similar way. We basically need to add other stages where we reorder the instructions. So the idea is conceptually very similar, and the changes we make to the pipeline are going to be very, very similar. Use a reorder buffer to reorder the instructions before committing them to the architectural state. An instruction updates the register alias table when it completes execution. Maybe I will show that in a little bit. But this is also called the front-end register alias table or, or front-end register file, even though it may not be a register file. It's a register alias table. An instruction updates a separate architectural register file when it retires. So you have a separate register file at the end that's updated only when an instruction is committed in sequential program order, just like the reorder book, right? I.e., when it's the oldest instruction in the machine has complete execution without exceptions. In other words, the architecture register file is all up, always updated in program order, as I said. On an exception, if you have an exception, you flush the pipeline, and what you do is you copy the architectural register into the front-end register file. So this is very, very similar to the reorder buffer that we've discussed. So as a result, we have something like this. 
So let me go through this uh, with the with the new thing that I've introduced over here so that you get a glimpse of how actually real processors do it. Remember, we got rid of the values, right? So there are no values. So if you have this register alias table, I'll call it the front end register alias table. And we have the values on the tags. And what we will do is this. We'll have an architectural register file at the end that gets updated only when an instruction retires in sequential program order, okay? So architectural register file can be from register zero to let's say register 31, and we update this only when an instruction retires at the end in program order, which means that this is always the correct sequential architectural state according to von Neumann semantics. Now this is good, uh, and when you actually have uh, an exception, let's say, you flush the entire pipeline because you know that everything else is, should not be executed, and then you copy this to here, right? This is fine if you, if you store the values over here, right? Because these are all values, and you know that these are all valid, this is a valid architectural state, assuming you retired instructions in order. But if you get rid of values here, you have a problem. You cannot store the value from here to here, right? But existing machines are quite smart. What they do is, this is the front-end register alias table. I'll call it the FE rat, front-end rat. And what they do is they don't store values even here, but they actually store the pointers to the architectural state. So a physical register file becomes the only place that stores all possible registers in the system. So this is, I'll call it the back-end rat or architectural rat, register alias table. These are essentially pointers to registers that are actually architectural, that house your architectural state. So R0, for example, was updated by the latest instruction that got retired that wrote to R0. You can say this is in physical register 128. R1 is physical register zero, R2 is physical register 10, dot, dot, dot. Basically, these are the physical registers that store the architectural values. So you can actually have, you have pointers to the physical register file. This also has pointers to the physical register file. And this gives you the architectural state. Oh. And this gives you the renaming state. Meaning, this is the register alias table that takes into account all of the instructions that are in the machine. And this is the register alias table that takes into account only the retired instructions out of the machine. Does that make sense? Now we've gotten rid of values everywhere. We don't have register files separately. We just have a single register file that stores all of the registers, except some of them are architectural, some of them are speculative. Speculative meaning they're there to, uh, to be written by instructions that are inside the pipeline. And what you do is, let's assume that uh, you have an instruction over here. Let's assume that the destination will be physical register 67. When it finishes execution, it becomes the oldest, and after it and it's going to write to register five, let's say, for some reason. Uh, it's, it's an instruction that writes to register five, uh, and register five is mapped to physical register 67. When you retire this instruction, meaning that it becomes the oldest, there are no exceptions, and you commit it, all you need to do is this. Register 5 gets mapped to physical register 67. It may have been mapped to something else. You just need to change the pointer. Does that make sense? Because you've already written to the physical register file. So when this instruction executes over here, what it does, it writes to the physical register file, physical register 67. It writes its value. Remember, let's go back. Let's pull back a little bit. Let's assume that this is an instruction. Let's simulate this instruction. I'd like to do it uh, in a nicer way so that we can at least go through one simulation. Okay, let's do this multiply over here. And I'm gonna assume that that's the only thing uh, that's executing. And basically, let's do this. R1, R2, valid, values are gone. We have the physical register file. R1 is mapped to physical register 50. R2 is mapped to physical register 80, let's say. And we have the backend register alias table here. 
uh, let's say we're only concerned with R1, R2, and R3. What we will do is R1 is mapped to 50, R, uh, R2, R2 is mapped to 80. So we're going to, we got rid of the values over here. We're going to do the same thing. When we get this instruction, this is one, physical register 50. We're renaming, as you remember. This is one, physical register 80. Okay, we've renamed. Uh, we've actually put the instruction over here. Now we need to rename the destination. That's R3. We allocate a physical register over here. There needs to be a free list in the machine that says which physical registers are free. So you pick one from the free list and allocate. This becomes invalid. And this instruction is going to write to a physical register, let's say 97. I picked 97 for you. And you put physical register 97 over here as the destination physical register. Now we got rid of the values, but we need to keep track of the destination. This is our rename now. This is our namespace. Okay, so when this instruction becomes ready to execute, which is in the next cycle, what it does is the first thing we do is we access the register file to get physical register 50. Let's assume that the value is 10 at physical register 50. We access the register tile to get the physical register 80. Let's assume the value is, I don't know, 15. So we get those values, 10 and 15, and we go through the six cycle multiply. At the end of the six cycle multiply, we get 150 over here, and our tag is physical register 97. What we do is we go back and write into physical register 97, 150, speculatively, and broadcast physical register 97 tag everywhere, just like we did yesterday, again. So it goes, it got broadcast everywhere, as you can see, including here. So now this becomes one. It's valid because the value is in physical register 97, but we don't capture the value because we're not we don't have values here. Next instruction that comes and that sources R3 can get it from physical register 97. Make sense? So this instruction is executed now. It's done, but it's not the oldest in the machine, let's assume. When it becomes the oldest, so you basically put this. At this point, you write to the physical register file, you broadcast the value, and you put it into the reorder buffer. So you just introduced that over here. We put it into the reorder buffer, and now the reorder buffer says oldest instruction. It's this multiply over here that's writing to physical register 97, and so architectural register is, so you need to keep track of all of this, uh, which is R3, right? Now let's assume that it's, it has other indicators. It doesn't have any exceptions, right? So when this becomes the oldest, we check in the reorder buffer and we say, oh, this instruction is the oldest. It doesn't have exceptions, so I sh I'd better retire it. Now what does that mean? This is the backend register alias table. It's our architectural state. Previously, let's say R3 was mapped to, I don't know, physical register uh, 3, let's say, for some reason. So previously, R3 was here. But now this instruction is retiring, and it's changing R3. So it's basically going to replace physical register 3 with physical register 97 over here. Because it's already written the value into physical register 97. It's in the physical register file. Now it needs to make it architectural. Architectural meaning it's retiring the instructions, the oldest in the machine. It basically updates the architectural register alias tape. Make sense? So it's beautiful. You can go through it on your own also. We just went through one instruction very quickly. But this is exactly how an existing out of order machine works today. Okay. And I'll give you some examples of this uh, in just a little bit. Okay, so basically, we've done this. <laughs> of course, I didn't show you when you allocate into the reorder buffer, but whenever you're actually doing the renaming, you allocate into the reorder buffer also, at that point in time, in order. But that's not different from the machine we saw before. Basically, in the end, we have this happy pipeline. It's this happy camel over here, right? <laughs> Except we introduced two humps, scheduling and the reordering over here. Okay. So basically, uh, I think I already said this, most modern processors use the following. They use reorder buffer to support in-order retirement of instructions. They use a single register file to store all registers, architectural as well as speculative. Speculative registers are also called rename registers. Uh, and integer and FP are still separate, as we will see in a lot of the pictures and as you're seeing on your reading. And there are two register maps, just like I showed you, future or front-end register map or register alias table that's used for renaming, and an architectural register map at the back of the pipeline that's used for maintaining precise state, keeping the architectural state. 
And if you look at this, I'll actually show this over here. This is the Pentium 4. The Pentium 4 has this front-end registry alias table and the retirement, they call it the retirement registry alias table, architectural registry alias table. And you can see that this is the register file. It's actually a physical register file, just like I showed you uh, earlier. It's a, it's a single register file that houses all of the registers. And you can see that some of those registers are architectural. These are the architectural state. Uh, they, they point to the architectural state over here. And some of them are rename registers. And you can see that the reorder buffer keeps the status. So this is all Pentium 3. Uh, that actually has a similar structure. It has only a one uh, registry alias table and a retirement register file, but most people got rid of this one uh, over time. So it looks more like this today. But both have actually uh, design choices that, I, uh, that we've discussed, but we're not gonna cover more. And if you're really interested in how this works, this is actually one of the good papers that Intel has written a long time ago, describing how the microarchitecture of the Pentium 4 processor works. It's optional. Okay, basically what we've done is we've conquered out of order execution <laughs> in these lectures. And remember, there are four fundamental things that you need to do. You need to link the consumer of a value to the producer, and that's done through register renaming. You associate a tag with each data value, and as we just saw, the tag could be anything. I just showed that the tag doesn't have to be the reservation station entry, it could be the physical register file ID, right? That's what we did as a, essentially. You need to buffer instructions until they're ready, they get out of the way of ready instructions by inserting them into reservation stations. You need to keep track of the readiness of the source values of an instruction by broadcasting the tag. Instructions compare their source tags uh, to wake up. And when all source values of an instruction are ready, you dispatch the instruction to the functional unit. Wake up and select. And we've gone through all of this multiple times. So again, very quick summary, register renaming eliminates false dependencies and enables linking of the producers to the consumers. Buffering enables the pipeline to move for independent operations so that you don't block the pipeline. Tag broadcast enables communication of readiness of produced value between instructions. That's essentially what we did. And wake up and select enables out of order dispatch or data flow order dispatch. And we've already seen that an out of order engine as a result builds the data flow graph of a piece of the program. Which piece? Basically whatever piece that fits into this window. And this is our window. If you think about it, this is the window of instructions that we're seeing in the machine at that given point in time. This, in, this window has a special name. It's called the instruction window. Essentially all decoded but not yet completed instructions. Essentially these are all the instructions that are in the machine either waiting for execution or are already executed, but they're waiting for retirement. So you can actually form that data flow graph in the machine. So can you actually do it for the whole program? This is actually a theoretical question. If you want to do it for the whole program, you need to have a machine that houses all of the possible instructions, right, of the program. And that's very difficult to do. You might want to do that so that you can tolerate more latency, but in the end, your latencies are limited. Uh, but your programs can be unlimited, right? So how can we have a large instruction window? People have tried to do this for a long time, adding, because if you think about it, let's assume that you have a memory latency of a thousand cycles. And today it's not unreasonable. For example, Xbox 360, which is one of the most popular gaming engines of its time, uh, even though latency is so important in those gaming engines, the memory latency of Xbox 360 was 650 cycles at that time. This is, we're talking about like 12, 13 years ago, right? And that was not a very high frequency machine to begin with. That's a lot of cycles. And if you're fetching, let's say, four instructions per cycle, we will see super scalar execution in a little bit. So far, we've been fetching one instruction per cycle, but you will soon fetch four instructions per cycle. If you want to make sure that your machine doesn't stall, you need to have an instruction window in the, if you want to ensure that your machine never stalls, you need to have an instruction window size of 650 times four. That's. 2,600, right? 2,600 instructions. That's a lot of complexity, especially if you want to operate that machine at high frequency. So you would like to do this, but it's very difficult to do this. So it's very difficult to efficiently scale the size of the instruction window for Thomas Lowe's algorithm because of all the complexity that we've seen over here. We've gotten rid of the value complexity, but we've not gotten rid of the general area that you will need if you want to scale the size of this. And people have worked on scaling the size of this 
for decades and decades. Actually, my PhD thesis was on that topic. How do you actually get rid of a lot of these structures in the machine such that you can make it more efficient, such that you can get the benefits of this large instruction window without having to build it? It sounds like magic, but you can do part of it. <laughs> okay, so I'll just uh, flash these because this is actually making the point again. You can build the data flow graph. It's a limited data flow graph, as you can see. It's not the entire program. But if your latencies are really high, if this, for example, takes a, a thousand cycles, you may actually want to have a much bigger data flow graph in your machine, such that you can actually figure out which instructions can execute down the street. Okay, a few more questions. I'll go through these relatively quickly. I actually gave you the answers earlier. Why is this beneficial? Because you get latency tolerance benefits, right? If all operations take single cycle, you don't really get much benefit out of this. Actually, strictly if all operations take single cycle, there's no point in doing out-of-order execution because you get the value anyway, immediately. Now, in a pipeline machine, not all operations, actually, in a pipeline machine, you'd be very lucky if an operation takes single cycle because by the nature of pipelining, you'll have multiple cycles, right? Even an ad takes multiple cycle of execution because it needs to go through the pipeline. So there is some additional latency that comes even if the operation itself takes a single cycle. Okay, basically out of order execution tolerates the latency of multi-cycle operations by executing independent operations concurrently. That should be obvious. That's exactly what we did, right? We executed independent operations while waiting for some other operations to uh, complete. So I've already answered this question also actually. What if an instruction takes 500 cycles? How large of an instruction window do we need to continue decoding without stalling? It depends on how many instructions you're fetching and decoding per cycle. If it's one, the answer is 500. If it's four, the answer is 2,000. If it's 16, the answer is 8,000. Right? It's basically the maximum latency that you have times the number of instructions you want to fetch and decode per cycle. And soon we will see that we want to fetch and decode many, many instructions per cycle to get higher performance. Okay, I think we've already discussed this. Basically, this is the instruction window size. How many uh, instructions that you can have in the machine in the reservation stations and the reorder buffer. Okay, so this is the paper that you're reading. As you can see, we, we walked through this earlier, uh, but I'll walk through this a little bit uh, again. You see that there are integer and floating point register files, decode, rename, dispatch, and things are divided into floating point and integer and there's reordering over here. This is Intel Pentium 4. This is their ugly picture from that uh, journal paper. If you're really interested, you can take a look at it, but it's a complicated machine, essentially. We, we're not even going to talk about some of these things over here, like trace caches. There are special instruction caches, such that you can supply data in the presence of branches. But if you look over here, uh, there is a memory, micro ops, memory instructions, let's say, memory scheduler, there's integer and floating point micro ops instructions. Some of them are fast, some of them are slow, some of them are simple. So there's a lot of, these are all reservation stations, if you will, and they're, they're different reservation stations. So fast one is actually interesting. So this part of the machine, uh, Pentium 4 had what's, what was called, a, what, was, what they called a fireball. Essentially, this part of the machine ran 2x faster than every other part of the machine meaning that they could actually execute instructions much faster, and they actually designed very special ALUs to do this really fast. So the machine was three gigahertz, let's say, but this part ran at six gigahertz. And that, that introduced additional complexity because they wanted to get, get rid of these integer instructions very quickly because they knew how to do that. They were able to build these uh, fa very, very fast ALUs for simple instructions, as you can see. For complex instructions, they need to go through the uh, slow value. But all of these essentially have reservation stations over here, and you can see that the register file comes after the reservation stations, just like I've, des I've described to you now. Reservation stations don't have the values, you get the tags, and you figure out which register to read, you read your registers, and immediately you go into the execution units as an instruction. And then after that, they don't show it over here, I think. Yeah, they don't show the full picture over here, but then you, you retire the instruction, you, you, you put the instruction into a reorder buffer. And this is my cartoonish picture, my ugly picture of the same uh, processor or a similar processor uh, in my paper. But basically, it, it, looks the same, it looks like the same thing over here. You have the floating point execution units and different units over here, and you can see that there's a reorder buffer and a retirement register alias table and there are other things over here. You don't need to know these exactly, but this is just to show you exactly uh, how, how different processors operate. 
except the principles are all similar. This is alpha 21 to 64. This is a paper that I recommend, uh, although it may be hard to read sometimes uh, for some, but you can see that there's renaming, there's the issue queue, the issue queues is the reservation stations, and then after the reservation stations, you access the physical register file, right? Just like we've discussed. Similarly, you do this through the floating point. Now this, this machine was interesting because I actually had two copies of the register file. Because they actually were not able to, they wanted to run at 500 uh, megahertz at the time, and they could not have four ports, uh, let's see, not four ports, they could not have an eight-ported register file that would run at 500 megahertz and give you the results in a single cycle. So what they decided to do, they duplicated the register file, this has four ports, this has four ports. Now you can run this in one cycle and it would give you four registers because you need four registers. There are two instructions that are sent over here, there are two instructions that are sent over here as you can see. So this is, a, as you can see, how people optimize to get the high clock frequency. That's what they exacted. Now you need to make sure that these registers are consistent. For example, if, if you're writing to a location, you need to write both into this register file and this register file. Now what happened in this case was you were able to, an instruction that was executing here was able to write to this register file in one cycle, but this register file got the update one cycle later. Why? Because there was a wire delay from here to here, and you need to make sure that you don't get the incorrect result. So you see the uh, difficulty of hardware designer. Or you could actually punt it to the compiler and compi you say compiler should not send instructions uh, one cycle uh, after, uh, before one cycle to this register file if the value is produced from here, right? You could always have different solutions. Okay, this is another one, MIPS R10,000. Remember MIPS, multi uh, microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. This had the philosophy of instruction, hardware should be simple uh, and uh, compiler can be complicated. But now, actually, they, they've actually, uh, and for a long time, they didn't have auto order execution, but auto order execution has a lot of benefits as we've discussed. So they built a machine that's as complicated as all of the other machines to get the benefits of auto order execution. And if you look at this, this is very similar. This adds some more things, some more things meaning this shows some more things that actually exist over here also, but they don't show it. Like their free register list, as you can see, which ones are free, which ones are just like I showed earlier. But you can see that there's a floating point register file, load store and integer register file, and they're accessed after the reservation stations over here. And if you're really interested, you can read that paper also. And this is IBM Power 4. This was uh, IBM's uh, first multi-core processor, one of the first multi-core processors of its time. But if you look at each core, it had two cores. Each core looks like this, essentially what we just discussed, an out-of-order machine. And IBM calls this global completion table, which is essentially the reorder buffer of IBM. And it has a bunch of stuff that you don't, you don't know all of these, but you can see that it had an eight wide instruction fetch. It was able to fetch eight instructions per cycle, eight parallel pipelines. We will see that this is super scalar execution. After the break, we're gonna talk about that. This is IBM Power 5, which is very similar to IBM Power 4, except it added multi-threading. And we will talk about multi-threading. This is essentially, what Intel calls hyper-threading right now, you have multiple threads uh, that can be uh, executing on the same machine. So you can actually have, as you can see, there are two threads, two program counters. Uh, register files shared, that's one thing you can do with renaming. You could actually share the register file and share all of this between different threads. You don't need to dedicate separate register files if you have out-of-order execution in the system. And you need to have this reorder buffer, that's the group completion buffer as they said. But all of these operate based on similar principles, and this is really a good place to take a break. Let's take a break, and then we'll continue. Let's get started. We're, we're running later than I thought, so we're not gonna cover all of the execution paradigms, but hopefully this is interesting. Now you're really learning exactly how an existing machine works. And we're gonna make it a little bit more complicated because before we leave off auto order execution. So this is actually the really hairy part of auto order execution. It's really memory. So far we have not talked about memory, right? The, the instructions that we looked at are simple multiplies and adds. And if you thought they were hard, they're not hard. They're actually the easy part of the machine. 
The hard part of the machine is this part. How do you handle loads and stores? And this is really the limiting part of the machine. Uh, so some of you actually asked, uh, how, how big is the physical register file today, for example? So existing physical register files on the order of 256 or so entries. You may have architectural registers that are 8 or 16 in x86, for example. But we have 256 entry register files. So this tells you you can actually have a lot of instructions that are renamed inside the window. But usually, your instruction window size is limited by how many loads and stores you can keep in the window. And let's see why. So the fundamental question is registers versus memory. So what are the differences between these? So far, we've considered registers as part of the state. We've developed the architectural register maps, physical register maps, physical register files, architectural register files. But we've ignored memory. But there's a fundamental difference between registers and memory. Actually, there are three. And I'll give them to you because we don't have a lot of time to actually have a discussion at the moment. But one of them is, if you look at the compiler, the compiler knows the registers, right? But it may not know the memory addresses. The memory addresses can be computed dynamically, right? You may actually be going through a linked list or a tree, for example, and compile has no idea what the memory addresses that you're going to access are because they're going to de be determined dynamically. So now this poses a problem. If you want to execute some instructions before or after a load or a store, how do you do that out of order? Because you may not know the memory addresses. You cannot rename the memory addresses. Renaming was easy with the registers because whenever we fetch an instruction, we know which register it's going to access. Whenever we fetch a load or store, we don't know what location it's going to address. Right. The other issue is the issue of size. Register state is small. It could be only 16 registers. In MIPS, it's 32 registers. Memory state is huge. Let's assume that it's 2 to the 64, right? That's a lot. So even if you knew this, can you actually rename memory locations? So it, it's, it becomes very impractical to rename memory. And there, there's another thing that we have not discussed that much, but this actually has a lot of effect on the design of systems today. Register state is not visible to other processors. Whenever you have a thread, registers are on your own. But if you're doing shared memory multi-threading uh, multi or pro uh, programming that with threads, register, memory state is shared between threads or processors. So you should be careful about what you do to a shared memory location. If this thread updates it, another thread can see it, right? And if you update it wrong, another thread can see it wrong, right? So these are the three fundamental differences between registers and memory. When you know the address, how big is it? Who is it visible to? Okay. So let's take a look at the dependence handling. So we've looked at dependence handling in registers, and we've developed all of these mechanisms, right? But for memory, you need to do the same thing. You need to obey the memory dependencies in the order specified by the program. But we're executing these out of order, let's say. And of course, we need to do uh, so while providing high performance. The key problem is this. You don't know the memory address until a load or store executes. You know the base register ID to compute the memory address, but you need to access memory. Uh, you, you need to basically, you need to actually do that computation address generation computation to know the memory address. So basically, the first corollary is renaming memory addresses is difficult because you cannot do it at the beginning of the pipeline, just like we did it over here. If it's at the end of the pipeline while you're executing it, it's a bit too late, isn't it? Because you already fetched the instructions into the reservation stations. If you think about fetching loads and stores, it's too late. Okay. Determining the dependence or independence of loads and stores need to be handled after their partial execution. That's what the first corollary actually leads to. So how do you do that? Now we have a part of the machine that's going to, be, that's going to look a little bit different. So the third corollary is when a load or store has its address ready, which means that you've done the address computation, there may be some younger or older loads and stores with undetermined addresses in the machine. Now, this sucks, actually, <laughs> because you may have your address ready. You know what your address is, but there, let's say this is a load. And there's a store that's earlier in the program that's in the machine, but it doesn't have its address ready because we're doing out-of-order execution, right? It may happen that way. Now, what do you do with this load? You know its address, but you don't know if the store is going to 
right to the location that this load is going to try to read from. So there are multiple options to this. Basically, when do you schedule a load instruction in out-of-order execution engine? We're going to talk about this at the expense of some of the execution paradigms. But this is also important because this is really the Achilles heel of all machines. Registers are easy, memory is hard. So basically, a younger load can have its address ready before an older store's address is known. I'm just restating the problem. This is also known as a memory disambiguation problem. This problem exists in hardware as well as in software, actually. If you, do, if you reorder instructions in software, if you do compiler-based code scheduling, if you do programmer-based code scheduling, you still need to reason about this. You need to ensure that you don't get the wrong value because you reordered some part of your program, some, part, some of your loads earlier than some of the stores that are going to write to it. So this problem actually exists everywhere, if, if, even if you're the programmer who are optimizing the code. It's also called the unknown address problem. But at the lowest level of the hardware, right now we're looking at an unknown address problem. So there are three approaches. So let's, let me actually pictorially demonstrate this ad unknown address problem because it's very simple conceptually and pictorially. I don't know why this decided to focus on its own this much, but basically, let's think of this this way. You have a reorder buffer, and I'm going to assume a reorder buffer. This is the oldest instruction. This is the youngest. You can think of this, and then there's a, a let's say this is the load unit, and then this is the store unit. You don't need all of this, but basically the problem is you have a load over here that's not the oldest, that's not the youngest, and in the load unit, it has its address ready. It is address 1000. So I'm not gonna put the address over here because it's normally not stored over there, but then you have actually a store over here that happens to be in the store unit over here. Its address is not known. Address is X. So the key question is, should this load go ahead and execute, right? How do you even know that address, right? Because you know the address over here, but you don't know if the store is going to write to 1,000. If it does, this load should get the data from the store, not from, I don't know, let's say a cache over here. If this doesn't store to 1,000, if this stores to, I don't know, a million, then the store doesn't overlap with this load, meaning that this load is safe to go. So now you have a choice. What do you do? You can either wait for all of the previous stores to have their addresses. So there might be actually, let's say, if your window is large, there can be, let's say, tens of stores over here. Wait until all of those stores compute their addresses and check the addresses and then say, oh, I can execute. That takes a long time. What if none of those stores are actually going to write to 1,000? You wasted a lot of time delaying this load. You could say, oh, I'm going to get, go speculatively and assume that none of the load, none of the stores that are earlier are going to write that thousand. That sounds good if most of the time that's true, but if you're wrong, you need to re-execute, right? This is very similar to branch prediction. It's a little bit different because now it's load address known prediction or address overlap prediction or memory dependence prediction, as it's called, and all machine, machines that are out of order that try to get high performance actually do this, memory dependence prediction. They predict whether this load is dependent on a previous store. So let's, take, let's go back to the slide and talk about three different approaches. I've already said two of them, actually. The first approach is very conservative. You basically stall the load until all previous stores have computed their addresses or even retired from the machine. Now you know that, that uh, this, uh, this uh, load is either dependent or independent of uh, those loads. So you can get the value from those loads. That's another issue which we will talk about. But at least you can, you're conservative in your scheduling. You'll wait. The problem is it's slow, right? You can be very aggressive. You can assume the load is independent of unknown address stores and schedule the load right away. Or you could be intelligent. You could predict with a more sophisticated predictor if the load is dependent on any unknown address store or a particular unknown address store. Now there's complications over here, which we will also briefly talk about. So basically you can say, whenever you compute the address of this load, you can consult a predictor called the memory dependence predictor, and this predictor says, oh, you're dependent, or you're independent of any previous load. If it says this one, okay, you go ahead and execute. If you're dependent, 
maybe the solution is to wait. If you're dependent, this address predictor can be, uh, maybe dependence predictor can be even more intelligent. It can say, oh, you're actually dependent on the store over here. So wait for that store only. That's a possibility. But of course, this complicates uh, the design even more, right? And people have actually developed many, many of these dependence predictors. We're not going to go over how, it's, how this dependence prediction is actually done, but some of them exploit the program structure. For example, if you have a function call, before the function call, you save the registers to memory locations. After the function call, you load the memory re registers from the memory locations, and you know which loads and which stores may be dependent on each other, right? Not always, but sometimes. Okay, so there are two questions over here. A load dependent status is not known until all previous store addresses are available. How does the auto order engine detect dependence of a load instruction on a previous store? The, option, the first option, conservative option, wait until all previous stores are committed. Committed means they actually finished, they wrote to memory, so you know that there's no store that's going to write to the location that you're going to read from, so this load is safe to execute. But this is very slow, as I said. The second option is keep a list of pending stores in a store buffer and check whether load address matches a previous store address. This is what most machines do. They don't do the first one. First one's really, really bad in terms of performance, as I will show you later. So this is essentially, this, this one is called a store queue, or store buffer. Essentially, in the machine, you have what's called a store buffer. And this is a program order list of stores, uh, youngest. And this could be unallocated at this point, right? So you basically have the list of stores, the program, uh, the, the address, if it's known, uh, and the data, if it's valid. So address may be known, data may be valid or not valid, right? And then you need to have the size also. So now you can see that you need to have a lot of information in the store buffer. Basically, this is the list of stores that are pending in the machine, okay? And then the load, oh, okay, I can see it better over here. I wish there was a better way of switching between these things. This is why fine-grained multi-threading is very useful, or simultaneous one. And basically, a load, uh, when a load executes and computes its address, it needs to check the store buffer. So you have this load, let's say it computed its address, a thousand. What it needs to do is check, compare its address to all of the addresses over here. That's one option. And if some of the addresses are unknown, too bad, we still need to decide to do something, right? Okay, let's go back. We're gonna look at the complexity of this even more soon. The second question is, how does the auto order engine treat the scheduling of a load instruction with respect to previous stores? And this is what we just discussed. Assume load is dependent on all previous stores. Assume that you do this. Now you have the question, assume your load is dependent on all previous stores. You can assume the load is independent of all previous stores and predict the dependence. Let's take a look at these three options. They're upsides and downsides. If you assume load is dependent on all previous stores, there's no need for recovery, you just wait for a while. But this is too conservative because it delays independent loads unnecessarily. As I said, you're trying to load from address 1000. There may be no store in the store queue, in the store buffer. Let's say the size of this is 50. I was just making it up. Uh, there may be no older store in the store buffer that's writing to address 1000. So if you're conservative, you'll delay that load for a long time. Now, if you're aggressive, you can assume that the load is independent of all previous stores and you don't even check, let's say. And uh, this is simple and can be the common case. There's no delay for independent loads. Actually, people have figured out that this is relatively common case in uh, a lot of workloads. But the problem is if you're wrong, you need to recover and you need to re-execute load, the load and its dependence. Actually, most of the machines just flush the pipeline and restart by fetching the load because they fetch the wrong value. This is essentially a value prediction if you think about it. You're predicting the value by uh, assuming that you're not dependent on any other store. You're just getting the value from the cache. The, the third option is intelligence. They can predict the dependence of a load on an outstanding store. This is more accurate because it turns out load store dependencies persist over time. If this load is dependent on this store, it's going to be dependent on that store again the next time it's executed and again and again and again. It turns out this is relatively predictable, but if you're wrong, and in some cases you're wrong, 
you still need to recover and re-execute. So most modern machines do this actually. For example, alpha 21 to 64, if you read that work, it says, we initially assume the load is independent. We, we have no information about this load. Load comes into the machine. It computes its address. There are some unknown address stores before that. And we assume it's independent. And if we're wrong, we flush the pipeline, set a bit in the instruction cache for the load saying that the next time you execute this load, don't assume that it's independent. Wait for all of the stores. That was a very simple prediction mechanism, right? One bit per machine. But there are a lot of other uh, proposals. This is actually a famous paper over here. It's an interesting case where one university sued multiple companies because they thought that those companies violated uh, the patent. They didn't just write a paper, they also patented the work. And they were able to get a lot of money from those multiple companies. I'm not sure if I would recommend that to any university, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so this is one example over here. Uh, so this, I, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but this is conservative, this is aggressive, this is perfect. If you do this perfectly, this speculation, this memory dependence prediction. As you can see, these are different applications. This is instruction per cycle performance of a machine that looks like the Alpha 21 364. And you can see that in most, uh, overall, conservative is not good. Aggressive, overall, is better, as you can see. So it's better to be aggressive. It's better to assume that the load is independent of previous stores, because most of the time, load is independent. But it's better to be perfect, as you can see. And most of the machines actually, uh, based on this history-based prediction, get close to perfect. They're not perfect, this still limits the performance of the machine. Okay, any questions? Sounds like fun, right? Now you're seeing the most complicated parts of an out-of-order machine. So there is another issue. Uh, we cannot update memory out of program order. So you need to actually buffer all store and load instructions in the instruction window, right, before they retire. So even if we know all the addresses of past stores, when we generate the address of a load, two questions still remain. So even if you have perfect knowledge of the addresses, how do we check whether or not it's dependent on the store, assuming you want to do that, assuming you don't want to wait until all stores finish execution? How do we forward data to the load if it's dependent on a store? So essentially what I said is uh, before, modern processors use a load queue and a store queue for this, or they can combine these. And whenever uh, a load executes, it generates an address, it searches the store queue to find if it's dependent on an older store. So let's, say, let's search the store queue uh, a little bit. I'll try to do this quickly. But basically, we have this load queue, let's say. I'm gonna assume that it's fine right now, but we execute this load over here. Let's say it's instruction in, in terms of program order, let's assume that you have a sequential instruction number, this is 68. And that's the sequential order. And it generates an address 1000. And there are some stores over here in the store queue. Let's assume that it's full. This is the youngest. And this is the oldest. And let's assume we have 50 of these stores. And we know all the addresses, all the addresses are somehow computed. Fine. How do we check which store this load is dependent on. Well, what we can do is we can compare this address 1000 to all of the addresses that are stored, right? And we know how to do that comparison. You just have a comparison for each entry, 50 different comparators. That's fine. We did that for the tag match. In this case, it's a wider comparator. If your address is 64 bits, it's a 64 bit comparator. Doesn't sound that good. A lot of power. But it's not as easy. Because what might happen is your address, there might be a store that has 1,000 over here, another store. There might be multiple stores writing to address 1,000. You want to get the latest one that's older than this. So let's, assume, let's look at the instruction numbers of this. This is the sequence number I'll call. This may be one, this may be two, let's say. Let's say this is 60 and this is 90. You really want to get the value from this one, right? Because this is instruction 60 in terms of sequence, and this is 68. You don't want to get it from here. 
You don't want to get it from here because this is the latest value, latest store that updated that address. Now it's not just a comparison, it's an age-based comparison. So you need to take into account the sequence number also. That sucks a little bit more. <laughs> but that's not enough. We didn't take into account one more thing, which is this is not just an address. We're not just loading one byte. Well, we may be loading one byte, but let's say that we're loading a word. So let's say we have a load word, and we want to load four bytes. And let's say this is a store byte to address 1,000. This is another store byte to address 1,001. This is another store byte to address 1,002. So this load is actually dependent on, well, not this one because it's 90. <laughs> this load is actually dependent on these two stores. So you need to have logic to detect that. Basically, you need to get address 1,000 from here, 1,001 from here. Well, the data at those addresses, and you need to read the rest from the memory. So it's an overlap search now, right? It's not an exact address match. You really want to search load address, comma, load address, plus size. You need to check if this overlaps with any older store address, comma, store address, plus size. It's really a range search, range comparison, as opposed to an exact comparison. And any range that overlaps, you want to get that. And there may be multiple stores that overlap at different parts of the range. You need to ensure that you get the right values. So that's one of the reasons why this is one of the most complicated parts of the machine. It's not a simple search. We'll get back to this. And a store searches, actually, oh, oh, go back to that. So let's assume that you did the search and you got the wrong, the correct value. And this is if you know all of the addresses, right? If you know all of the addresses, you still need to do the search. This was actually called the memory ordering buffer in Pentium Pro at Intel, but all machines have a form of this. A store also searches uh, the load queue after it computes its address. This is usually done so that to support uh, memory dependence prediction. So why is this done? Essentially, whenever a store computes its address, it does a similar search. It does the opposite in the sense that it checks whether there's a younger load that actually is waiting for that address, right? And now you can supply that data value to that younger load. Or, I mean, it depends on how you design the machine, but it also checks if a younger load actually got the wrong value because it assumed that it was not dependent on the store when it got scheduled. So you need to ensure that you maintain the correct dependencies. That's why you need to do these two searches. And as a result, machine becomes much more complicated. So if you thought registers were complex, memory is a lot more complex. And this is where the real fun starts in the design of a machine. It's really the memory. OK. Mm, out of our completion of memory ops, basically, when a store instruction finishes execution, it writes its address and data in its reorder buffer entry. If you think about the reorder buffer, it's essentially the store buffer. Now, the store buffer is kind of like the reorder buffer for stores, right? So you don't want to search the entire reorder buffer because reorder buffer may include other instructions. That's why the store buffer is interesting because it contains only the stores. It can reduce the size of the data structure that you're searching. Because you may have 256 instructions, but only 50 of them may be stores. Okay, when a later instruction generates its address, it basically searches the reorder buffer or the store queue with its address, accesses memory with its address, receives a value from the youngest, older instruction that wrote to that address, either from the reorder buffer or the memory or the store queue over here. So as, as we discussed, it's a complicated search logic implemented as content addressable memory as we just walked over it. Content is memory address, but you also need size and age. And this is called the store to load forwarding logic. Basically, the complexity is this. You need content addressable search based on the load address. You need range search based on the address and the size of both the load and earlier stores. You need to do age-based search for last written values. And even that's not enough because the value may not come from all of the things that you search for because none of them may match. You may actually need to get the value from the cache or memory. 
What is worse is part of the value comes from the store buffer, part of the value comes from memory and cache. Now you need to merge those. So if you're doing a four byte load, two bytes can come from here and two bytes can come from memory. Right? So okay, basically you need to handle this. And machines take different approaches to this, but they cannot avoid this complexity. Either they lose performance because they cannot handle some of these really well, or they become very complex. And as a result, what is really limiting the performance of a lot of these out of order machines is the size of your store queue or load queue. How many of these loads and stores you're going to support. So this is a really good problem to solve if you want to make these machines much more scalable. Okay, so hopefully I've given you a lot of, uh, this doesn't go into all of the details of a machine, but now you have, the, you have a good idea of how out of order machine is designed. In the rest of uh, the class, we're going to talk about alternative approaches. Any questions on out of order execution? You're having fun? Maybe, okay. <laughs> You'll have fun. <laughs> okay, in the rest of the uh, course, we're gonna look at a lot of uh, other approaches. I'm gonna cover this relatively quickly because we've actually looked at data flow at the ISA level. I'm, guess, I'm just going to point to differences from out of order execution. And then we're gonna cover superscalar execution today. That's an easy concept after we covered, but we may not be able to get to VLIW today. But then we're gonna look at some even more fun approaches like fine-grained multi-threading, SIMD processing, which is vector and array processors. And these two are actually employed by all modern GPUs. And we're gonna look at GPUs, how they behave compared to these other engines that you discussed. And we're gonna look at two other execution models, decoupled access and execute very quickly, and systolic arrays which have become more popular recently with the, with the machine learning accelerators that people are building in hardware. Okay, so let's do this review very quickly. Essentially, what we, if you remember, we talked about data flow. And data flow, the concept is availability of data determines order of execution. And a data flow node fires when source are ready and the programs are represented as data flow graphs of nodes. And data flow at the ISA level as we've discussed earlier when we talked about von Neumann, has not been as successful. Because at the ISA level, it's very difficult for the programmer to reason about this. They can draw the data flow graphs, that's good actually. At the programming level, people have used data flow. But at the instruction level, once you have the data flow graph, there's no ordering associated. As a result, it's very difficult to debug these programs. So at the higher level, programming level, people have used data flow graphs to program. But when they get translated, they don't get translated into data flow ISAs. They get translated into sequential ISAs so that you can reason about the ordering. And at the, underneath, as we've just seen, it becomes a data flow graph again. Essentially, data flow implementations under the hood while preserving the sequential ISA semantics have been very, very successful, as we've seen with all of these example machines. And I could give you many, many examples we could be sitting through a few years probably going through all of these examples and studying them in detail. Oh, this is going back. So let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of pure data flow. Pure data flow meaning data flow at the ISA level. This is very, very good at exploiting irregular parallelism. If you actually have the choice, it's good to have a data flow ISA. Because now you, you, you have the parallelism available to the machine, right? Machine doesn't need to figure out which instruction is dependent on which other instruction. All of this out of order complexity, out of order execution complexity will go away because somebody provided that data flow graph to you. That's beautiful. So that's a big advantage. Only real dependencies constrain processing and more parallelism can be exposed than the von Neumann model. The downside is big though. The first big downside is there is no ordering across these data flow nodes. As a result, there is no precise exception or precise state semantics, and we covered that. This is really, really important for the program. We can reason about programs easily today because we can reason about the ordering of execution of different instructions. And because you cannot reason, debugging is very difficult, and interrupt and exception handling is very, very difficult uh, also in these machines. And also, people actually built these data flow machines, and they figured out that this is true more parallelism can be exposed, but they also figured out that there's too much parallelism for the hardware to handle. So data flow graph comes in, they just don't have enough execution units in the hardware, so the data flow uh, program chokes 
in the sense that there's just too much parallelism, and now you need to manage that parallelism. Because you don't have any, enough execution units, you need to buffer these instructions that come in through the data flow program, and there's a lot of additional complexity added to manage that parallelism. And as a result, you have high bookkeeping overhead. So essentially, you can think of this machine as an out-of-order machine with a lot of overheads, but you don't need to discover which instructions are dependent on which other instructions, because that's given to you by the data flow graph. So it comes with advantages and disadvantages, but because the, this, this is a huge disadvantage, people were not able to sustain data flow at the ISA level, but at the microarchitecture level, it's been very successful as we've discussed. Okay, let's cover superscalar execution. Any, any questions on data flow, out of order? This should be old news because we've already discussed the data flow concepts, basic concepts at the ISA level earlier. So this is actually a really interesting idea that a lot of people tried to implement for decades, but it became really successful when people said, okay, we're not gonna change the ISA, the ISA is sequential, but underneath we're gonna implement data flow. That made the entire difference. Okay, so let's talk about superscale. This is an easy concept, as I said, and the concept is very simple. As opposed to fetching one instruction, or decoding and executing retiring one instruction per cycle, you do it for two instructions per cycle, or actually n instructions per cycle. Essentially multiple instructions per cycle. So n might superscalar means n instructions per cycle. You're able to fetch n instructions per cycle, which means that you need to add the hardware resources for doing so, right? And superscalar is special because hardware performs the dependence checking between concurrently fetched instructions. We're gonna contrast this later on to VLIW, where it's the responsibility of the software to ensure that instructions are not, depend not dependent on each other. This is very important. A lot of people actually confuse these. When they say superscalar, they mean out of order. When they say out of order, they mean superscalar. But this is wrong. These are completely orthogonal concepts. You can have all four combinations of the following processors. You can have in order scalar, and an in-order processor that can execute, fetch one instruction per cycle, an in-order superscalar, an in-order processor that can fetch multi multiple instructions per cycle, out-of-order scalar, an out-of-order machine that reorders the instructions, but it can only fetch one instruction per cycle, an out-of-order superscalar, an out-of-order machine that can fetch two, multiple instructions per cycle. So these are completely orthogonal concepts, uh, and I think even the paper that, you, that I recommended to you confuses these concepts sometimes. It's good to not confuse these separate concepts. So let, let's take a look at an example. This is an example of the superscalar processor that's in order. Essentially, you need multiple copies of the data path. You need to be able to fetch from two instructions, two consecutive instructions. So one program counter is enough. Now you read two instructions and decode two instructions over here, and then access the register file for two instructions. As you can see, now we have a lot of ports in the register file, and then have enough resources to be able to concurrently execute two instructions. As you can see, there are two ports, two address ports and two data ports from memory so that you can potentially execute two load instructions and two store instructions. And you can see everything is replicated by two, except for the fetch, because whenever you fetch, you supply a program counter and you get the two consecutive instructions. This is assuming two, of course, right? This is a two-wide superscalar. But if you want to make it 16, now your resources multiply a lot, right? And also you have a fetch problem. What do you fetch? In a single cycle, you need to decide which 16 instructions to fetch. Do you fetch 16 consecu consecutive sequential instructions? What if one of them is a branch? And if it's a taken branch? Well, now your branch pro prediction problem got exacerbated. It's not just horizontal problem, it's a vertical problem also because you're fetching 16 instructions per cycle and you need to determine whether you actually should fetch those 16 instructions, all of them. So you see the complexity that's, that we're adding to the machine. But the upside is, if the instructions that you fetched are independent of each other, that's great. Now you're actually always finishing two, in this case, two instructions per cycle. Right? If you have 16 instructions that are independent in your program, 16 instructions per cycle. That sounds great, right? But dependencies make it tricky to issue multiple instructions at once. Here, the ideal IPC is two. If you can fetch 16 instructions, ideal IPC is 16. That's a lot. So let's take a look at this one very quickly again. In this case, all of the instructions that are sequential are independent of each other. 
So you get two instructions per cycle. You can study this on your own. This is good. Six instructions are issued in three cycles. But if you have dependencies, you have a problem. In this case, your IPC becomes 1.2. You, because you can, you, have, you can only issue six instructions in five cycles. Again, I'm not going to go through this detail. This is simple dependency analysis that we've done many, many times uh, in this course. OK, let's take a look at the trade-offs of this. So the big advantage of this is concurrency, right? You get higher instruction level concurrency, higher instructions per cycle, essentially. The big disadvantage is higher complexity for dependency checking. So now you need to check whether the, uh, let's go back over here. Now you have the two instructions over here. Can you issue the next instruction at the same time? If not, you need to stall one such that it gets issued in the next cycle, right? And this is an in-order pipeline. We're not even looking at the out of order yet. We'll talk about the out of order in a little bit. Basically, you need to have a dependency check between concurrently fetched instructions in the decode stage. And if you're fetching 16 instructions per cycle, the last instruction in sequential order may be depend on any of the 15 that are previous to you. So this really becomes a tree where the next instruction checks all of the previous instructions that you actually just fetched. And that becomes a complex dependency check logic. OK. This is what we just said within a pipeline stage. Before we check for dependencies across pipeline stages, right? Now we're, you can think of this as horizontally. Before we checked across the horizontal axis, now we need to check for dependencies across the vertical axis. And renaming now becomes more complex in an out of order processor, right? Because now, remember, you need to know uh, which instruction you're dependent on to be able to do the renaming. You need to do this renaming sequentially. And you may actually, you, you, your renaming becomes sequential, essentially. People have tried to parallelize it. There are methods of doing it, but we're not going to go into that. But this complicates the out of order processor even more. And clearly, more hardware resources are needed because you want to execute more instructions, so you need to throw more, instruct, more hardware resources to be able to execute them. So if, I, uh, if you remember IBM Power 4, it, can, it, it was able to fetch eight instructions per cycle. Fetch, decode, execute, retire. So you need to have eight of these pipelines and have resources to be able to execute all of those eight instructions per cycle. As a result, your machine becomes bigger, clearly. In a lot of the machines today, you could do four instructions per cycle, and it's increasing. Um, uh, Pentium 4 was able to, for example, fetch six instructions every other cycle, and it was able to execute three instructions per cycle. So the fetch was actually slower. It could fetch six instructions every other cycle, three instructions per cycle. And it was able to execute three instructions per cycle. Actually, the, wide, uh, the execution units could be much wider. It could execute maybe eight instructions per cycle. I don't know. Maybe more. OK. Any questions? No questions? So you know everything about superscalar execution right now? That's good. <laughs> some of you are very confident. Some of you are, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> OK, but at least you know the concept. Uh, well, at this point, I'm going to do something new. And I'm going to let you guys early so that you can enjoy the weather. Because there's no way we're going to cover VLIW in the next five minutes. So next time, we're going to start with, hopefully, VLIW. OK, have a good weekend and maybe a long weekend.